Today is Mother's Day, and I love taking the opportunity every Mother's Day to share with the moms from God's Word. Mom, you're a treasure, a priceless treasure, a true gift from God. And you probably don't hear thank you enough, but the selfless acts of service that you offer over and over again for your family, they oftentimes go unnoticed, but you need to know that you're a treasure. And we are here this morning to bless and encourage you. Today is your special day. And we are here to bestow upon you the award of Doctor of the Year. Give mom a big hand. That's weak. Let's start over. We are here to give you an award this morning, the award of Doctor of the Year. Everybody give mom a big hand. That's what I'm talking about. We're giving you the award for Doctor of the Year for the nights that you've set up with sick kids, for the remedies that you have provided for your babies, and for especially your bedside manner. We've come to present you also with the Protector of the Year Award for the nights that you have snuggled with those in your house who were scared because of the thunder and lightning shaking the house or because there were monsters underneath the bed or lurking behind closet doors. Mom, your words of comfort and those strong arms of protection, they are more valuable than the Army Rangers or the Navy SEALs posted at your front door. We've also come to award you with the Counselor of the Year Award for the advice that you have given free of charge, always gratis. For your kids when they are perplexed and confused by the things going on in their life. And these are just a sampling of the many wonderful things that you do to bless the lives of those that the Lord has placed in your care. I've not even mentioned the meals that you've cooked, the diapers you have changed, the clothes you have kept clean, the homework that you helped with, the bedtime stories that you have read, or the prayers that you pray day in and day out, week after week. Mom, I told you, you're a treasure. Moms come in all shapes and sizes. They have different styles, different methods of doing what they do. Some moms are more committed to seeing what they do as a call from God than others. But make no mistake about it, loving, providing for, and shaping the lives of, of kids, that is kingdom work at the highest level. Moms, you need God's help. Moms need God's word for guidance, for strength, instruction, encouragement, and support. And moms need other moms, older moms, to listen, to teach, to encourage them along the way. And moms need fathers who will appreciate and support them. We like to make motherhood out to be some kind of fairy tale like story, but the truth of the matter is that motherhood can push a woman to the outer limits of frustration and insanity. Can I get an amen, Mom? Amen. And if you're here this morning and you don't believe me when I say that, then you fall in one of two categories. One, either you are not a mom, or two, you have not held that title long enough. <laughs> Older mamas, come on, help me out now. I want to appreciate you on this Mother's Day. I want to encourage you to continue to do what God has called you to do. And I also want to be honest. Let's face the facts. The simple mention of the word mom stirs a wide variety of responses from people. Some have had moms who were absent. Some that were there in the house but disconnected and had nothing really to do with their child. And others have had moms who mentored them in all of the wrong ways and led them down a dark path. The mention of the word mom can stir all kinds of feelings, but a mother after God's own heart is a beautifully strange creature. A mother who is first and foremost a woman after God's own heart will give and give, and there is no way that she will ever receive equal to the proportion to which she is given. But neither does she expect to receive that much. The sacrificial love of a godly mother is a beautiful thing to behold. God's call to mothers is a call to sacrifice. And that's simply not true of human mothers. 
It's also evident in the animal kingdom. I learned this many years ago. I saw a series on the Discovery Channel called Life. And in this one episode that I watched, they told the story of a Pacific giant octopus mom. I will never forget her story as long as I live. Because this mother is an example of the sacrificial love that I just described a few minutes ago. This eight-legged creature, when she becomes pregnant, she finds the perfect spot to lay her eggs. And once she has those eggs nestled underneath her, she stands as the provider and protector for the next six months. She protects them from predators. She oxygenates the eggs. She keeps them free from disease. She is so concerned for her unborn babies that she literally will not leave those eggs for the next six months even to eat. Eventually, near death from starvation, her last act is to breathe on the eggs which aids their hatching. New life emerges as her life fades away. A woman after God's own heart will gladly lay down her life for her kids. I mentioned to you earlier that moms need others to help them. To help them live out their God-given call. In God's Word, we read about how important it is for older women, older women to take time to teach the younger women how to love their husbands and their children. In Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children. I spent a lot of time this past week reading the stories of mothers in God's Word. I've read the stories of famous mothers and grandmothers like Ruth and Sarah, Rachel and Leah, Hannah and Jesus' own mother Mary. I've also read the stories of some not-so-famous mothers, mothers that we don't even know their names, like Samson's mom. And there's a lesson that I've learned this past week that I want to pass on to all of you. And the lesson is this. You give, you serve, and you love not because of the desired outcome for your kids, but you give, you serve, and you love as a holy offering to God. Now there's a big difference. We live in an outcomes-based society where what we want to do, we do for the purpose of, of the outcome that we desire. We're willing to make sacrifices. We are willing to give our all as long as we know that there is a goal, a prize, a reward that awaits us at the end of the journey of sacrifice. We're willing to make those sacrifices as long as we see hope. Hope that the end product is going to be there when we get to the end of the sacrifice. But if we become persuaded that our efforts are futile, then we are more than likely to throw in the towel. As I read the stories of the mothers in the Bible, it didn't take long for me to realize that the outcome of their labors are as varied as you can even imagine. Mom, as a woman of God, you do not what you do, you do as an offering, not for the end result that your kids will turn out to be a success. Did you hear that? What you do as a mother, you do for your kids, not for the, for the outcome of what you hope for their life, but you do what you do for your kids as an offering to God. We all want our kids to be a success, whatever that word means. We want our kids to be happy, to love God with all of their hearts and to contribute to the betterment of others as well as society. That's what we want, but that is not why you do what you do, Mom. A mother after God's own heart does what she does strictly solely as an offering to God, not to secure the success of her kids. I can't stress to you, especially you young moms, I can't stress to you how important it is for you to inscribe that sentence across your mind, across your heart, to keep it before you day in and day out. It's not the outcome, it is the offering that is most important. If we as parents, grandparents, 
If we can begin to live out this truth, then it will change the way that we see the day-to-day task that can feel so mundane, so toilsome at times. It can transform those mundane moments into moments of worship. Let me explain to you what I mean. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 14 through 17, we read about an interesting time in David's life. David was on the run. His life was perplexing. It was chaotic. And his future was absolutely uncertain at best. David was hiding with some of his men at the cave of Adullam. When David was reminiscing and he said, Oh, how I would love a drink of water from that well outside of Bethlehem. You see, David knew Bethlehem. He was born there. He herded his father's sheep by that well. And during a chaotic time in his life, David was reminiscing about a more peaceful time in his life. A more quiet time in David's life. Read this story with me, beginning in verse 14. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water, and he said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Now, you need to know that from the cave of Adullam to the well was 12 miles. A 12-mile journey, a long journey. And if that weren't enough, the Philistine military was nearby once the men made it to the well. But three of David's men heard their leader say, I'd like a drink of water from the well outside of Bethlehem. And they headed out. Talk about a servant's heart. They made that long journey. They broke through the Philistine defenses. They drew some water from the well. And they began that 12-mile track back to David with the water he desired. David, when they handed him that water, he was overwhelmed. He couldn't believe what those men, those three men, had done for him. David couldn't drink that water. Instead, he poured it out as a drink offering to the Lord. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but listen to this. David said, when he saw what those men did, he took that water and he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this. He said, is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives and David would not drink it? Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. What David did with that water was not disrespectful to those three men who risked their lives in the least. As a matter of fact, I would say that what David did with the water made a much greater impact on those three men and all who witnessed it that day than if David would have simply drank the water and said, Thanks, boys. David poured out the water as a drink offering to the Lord. You can read about drink offerings all throughout God's Word. The first occurrence appears in Genesis 25, in verse 14, where we read, Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. And when the sacrifices began to be made at the temple, the drink offering accompanied animal sacrifices. If a lamb or a bull was being sacrificed, then a drink offering of wine was also poured out. Now the animal sacrifices, some of them were to be eaten from, by the priest. Some, in accordance with the peace offering, could even be eaten by the people who brought them. But the drink offering... Not once is it ever partaken of by a human being. It is to the Lord and the Lord alone. With that in mind, let's go back to David. David saw the water that the men risked their life to get, and he recognized it as too holy for his lips. So he poured it out as an offering to God. Now, 
if you would have stopped those men, if you would have been somewhere between the cave of Adullam and the well in Bethlehem and the guys that already broken through the Philistine line, gathered up the water and were making their way back and you said, whoa, guys, fellas, what are you doing? They said, well, David wanted some water, so we went to get it for him. They were just doing their job in their eyes. David was their leader. He wanted water from a specific well. So they went to get what he asked for. Job done, task completed. But what David did by pouring that water out before those three men as an offering to the Lord was this. David took the ordinary and he redefined it in their eyes. With David's act, the ordinary became holy. What they had done David had made holy by pouring, pouring it out to the Lord. The men got the water so that David could drink it. That's the only reason they went. That was their desired outcome, right? Get the water, bring it to David. But once David turned their act into a moment of worship, David's drinking the water became irrelevant to them. None of them threw a fit. You mean we risk our life and you just poured the water out? No, what they had done was really for God. And now they saw it. And so it is with you, Mom. And so it is with you. Each and every day, you do what many see as nothing more than mundane task. Sometimes you even describe it that way. You change diapers. You put a million miles on an SUV, taking kids from this place to that place. You've cooked enough meals to feed a third world country. And everybody knows you spent more time at Walmart than Sam Walton himself. You've defended kids against bullies and mean girls. And you stopped doing some of the things that you used to do back in the day because you want to set a good example for your kids. Why have you done these things? Why do you continue to do these things? That is a great question for you to ponder. I tell you this, if you're doing those things so that you'll be appreciated and your kids will rise up and call you blessed, then you're more than likely to be disappointed. If you're making all those sacrifices you're making so that your kids will turn out right, then there is a chance you're going to be disappointed. If you're doing all of these things as nothing more than an offering to the Lord, then you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. You see, we think, and especially today, young mamas today with Google and all, just ask ChatGPT. We think that if we'll follow this book or that book or that method, then things are going to go our way and our kids will be all that they can be, just like those army commercials. We want to shape our kids into the people that we want them to be, but let me tell you, our perceived control is an illusion. In the time that we have remaining, I want to share the stories of two women with you. Actually, three women. Two from the Bible. The other happened just a few years ago. A few years ago, I was getting ready to go to Branson with a busload of seniors from our church. And I've got some friends up in that area, and one of them had been calling me because they have a child that um, was raised in a Christian home, a strong Christian home. This kid was a great athlete, a McDonald's All-American in basketball. And yet this kid rejected everything that they had been taught about the Lord. They wanted nothing to do with mom and dad's faith choices. And one of the parents was just losing their mind. So they called me like a week before I was to leave. Mike, is there any way I can come down to Oklahoma City? Or I, I heard you're coming up here to Branson. I said, I am coming to Branson. Well, is there any time I could meet with you to talk about this situation? I said, you know, from the moment we land in Branson until we leave, we are jam-packed. But there is one spot in there where we're going to be down at the, the river everybody's going to be shopping at the Branson Landing. We'll just be sitting on a public bench out in front of everybody, but if you need to talk that bad, come on. Tell me when. 
and they showed up and we sat there on that bench and we talked. I didn't get to shop for anything. I just listened and listened and listened. Barely could get a word in. They just could not understand. Family, worship, Sunday school, church, memorized scripture. They read every book that the leading Christian author had at the time on raising kids. How does this happen? Angry at God, angry at their spouse. It can't be my fault. It's got to be your fault. Their life was coming undone. Well, I tried to explain. What you've done is an offering to God. What your child has done is not a reflection on you. Your child has decisions to make. Let me show you the biblical example of what I'm talking about, can I? First of all, we hear so much today about the plight of single mothers. <clears throat> if you're a single mom here today, man, am I glad you're here. Because I'm sure you're being bombarded with statistics. We hear those statistics about kids from fatherless homes, the decisions they make, all of the horrible trouble that they get into, the likelihood that they're going to drop out of school. I'm so glad that you're here, single mama, because you need to know that the, the Lord will be a father for your children that that, that that present father could never be. And the Lord will be a husband for you, an encouragement for you, a provider, a support for you that that absent husband of yours could never ever be. There are all kinds of, of statistics floating around, but you need to know that they're just statistics. God knows your name. He knows your situation. And he knows your babies. And he has a plan for you as well as them. Jedidah was a single mom in the Bible. She was married for a period of time. Her husband was an evil man, a horrible man, a man named Ammon, who was the king of Judah for two years before he was assassinated. He had, he had turned away from the Lord. He was leading many people in the nation away from the Lord. And his own people assassinated him leaving an eight-year-old boy. What a horrible legacy to have to carry with you the rest of your life. Your dad was so bad, his own people assassinated him. That's a tough legacy to have to deal with. But let me tell you, Josiah didn't drop out of school. He didn't start smoking weed and hanging out with sleazy women. He didn't have thug life tattooed across his belly. He didn't father a bunch of kids that he never knew. He never went to jail. Josiah became the king of Judah. And he brought about the greatest transformation faith-wise in the history of that nation. And he reigned for 31 years. 31 years. During his 31-year rule, he brought incredible spiritual reform, so great that we read in 2 Kings 23, listen to this, single mama. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did. With all of his heart and with all of his soul and with all of his strength and according with all the law of Moses, so much for those statisticians that are putting a dark cloud over your home, single mama. God's got a plan for you and your kids. You know, we don't know a thing about this woman other than what we read in one verse of the Bible. We learn that she was the daughter of Adadiah. She was the wife of Ammon. She was the mother of Josiah. And she was from the town of Bozkath. But God knew every detail in an intimate way about her life. And he was with her all the days of her life. Now, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. <clears throat> There's a mother that I've spent a lot of time reading about this past week. I don't know her name. Jewish tradition tells us that her name was Zelponeth, but the Bible doesn't give us her name, so I'm going to go with that. We do know that she was married to a man named Manoah, not the movie. A man from the tribe of Dan. And one day an angel of the Lord appeared to her. And in Judges 13, listen to this. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile 
and childless. But you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Manoah's wife went and told him about all that had happened. She couldn't believe what the Lord had done in her life. And so she, the, her husband prayed in Judges 13, 8. Manoah prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, I beg you, let the man of God you sent to us come again and teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. Lord, give us the blueprint on how to raise this boy, this boy that you have set apart from birth, this boy that's going to begin the deliverance of the Philistines. Can you imagine what kind of parents these folks will be? They're going to raise him as a Nazarite. I mean, this child is set apart to God from the womb. Manoah's wife would not drink any wine no fermented drink whatsoever. She would make sure she would never eat any unclean food. It was whole foods only for this baby. Manoah would be meticulous in making sure that they brought that boy up right. He would read every book about being a strong, godly father. They would make sure their son was in Sunday school every single week, and they didn't drop him off at Sunday school. They went in the building and went to their own Sunday school class so they would set a good example for him. They would have family worship every night. The boy would have the best home training that a young man could possibly ever have. After all, he was going to be the one who would begin the deliverance of all the Jewish people from the hands of the Philistines. Well, you know the story of Samson. He was a rebel. That boy shattered his mother's heart. Just two verses after we read about the birth of Samson, it appears, I'm reading between the lines, but it appears that Samson has become a teenager and developed a mind of his own. Read along with me. Samson went down to Timnah and he saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. What in the world is this child thinking? What did he do with all those wonderful Bible lessons that he had been given? What did he do with the, the model mom and dad who had dotted every I and crossed every T, who had begun every day in prayer and ended every evening in prayer by the boy's bedside? What in the world was he thinking? They said, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to those uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, She's the right one for me. Manoah said, son, let's talk. Samson said, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. I know what's best for my life. No, no, no. Dad, I appreciate it. But I know what's best for my life. Parents, you ever heard that? You know a train crash is coming. Well, the marriage went bad. And Samson, he went from bad to worse. He went down to a prostitute in Gaza and spent the night with her in Judges 16. Then he ran into Delilah. And Delilah led to Samson's demise. The Philistines were using Delilah to get to Samson, and their plan worked. And Colin Gibson writes, On this Mother's Day, Samson's mother finally heard that her son had been captured and mutilated, forced into slavery and degradation. Brought out to make brutal sport for his captors, he died a suicide beneath their bodies and the ruins of a building he brought down in a final spasm of strength. 
You remember that young expectant couple? Manoah and his wife? Their hopes and dreams for their boy? They never imagined this. Can you imagine the questions that must have run through their minds? Samson's parents had done everything right. But Samson was not a computer in which you input data and you get out your desired outcome. You see, God has created people, all people, young people, old people alike, with decisions to make. And sometimes we, the old as well as the young, we make bad decisions. It doesn't have anything to do with how we were raised or what others may want from us. We all have choices to make, and some of those choices break the hearts of the people who love us most. Those of you who have older kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You might not have been a good mom. You'll admit it. I know some moms that have told me I'm amazed at what my child is doing today. I was not a good mom. And yet your child is serving the Lord with all their heart. And you know that, by, that their faith is not a byproduct of what you did in their life when they were young. It's all the grace of God. It's all of God's grace. And some of you moms here this morning, you may have raised your kids like Manoah and his wife. You were so focused on teaching your sons, your daughters, the truths of Scripture about the grace of God, the love of God, helping them to have an intimate relationship with Jesus, and they have rejected everything about Jesus. And you are perplexed to this day. You cannot figure out what went wrong. Let me tell you, there's a lot of young moms with us here this morning, and I want you to know, I'm not trying to scare you, and I'm not trying to rain on your parade. None of us knows how your kids will turn out, but that's besides the point. The point is this. The point is this. Make your every thought and your every action as a mother an offering to God and not an outcomes-based act. Trust him for your child's future and realize you do not have the power to control how your child will make the decisions that they will have to make throughout their life. You've got great control while they're young. Right now, those of you with the little ones, you got great control. But let me clue you in, you are losing control the older they get. That can be scary. I heard some nervous laughter. <laughs> I was out on the tennis court a couple of weeks with some of our kids and some of our coaches, and there was a mom out there, and her child was out there, and the mom said something to the kid, and the kid said something back, and the kid's like seven, eight years old, and the mom turned and looked at me, and I said, that one's going to be fun. She said, I'm going to need your help. I said, you're going to need all our help. But folks, that's what we do. That's why God has placed us in this body of Christ. So we can walk with one another and encourage one another and pray for one another. Mom, I want to ask you a question before we go. Would you say that so far, you as a mother in your relationship with your kid, it's been more outcomes-based? You're doing these things because you want your kid to be this, that, or the other. Or has it been an offering? I, it, I, would, I would assume 99% of us would say, yeah, I've been pretty outcomes-based. That's normal. Everything that we do in this life is outcomes-based, right? And that's why this morning I want to help change your mind. From this day forward, Make what you do, every word you speak, every action of engagement with your kids, make it be an offering to God. Now, that doesn't mean you won't ever have heartache. It doesn't mean you won't ever worry. Connie just told you, your middle name is worry. All of our kids are grown. Connie told me one time, I was quizzing her about worrying about something. She said, Mike, we don't carry them for nine months. We carry them the rest of their life. 
I don't know anything about that. She does. So it doesn't mean you won't worry. But it does mean it would be very freeing to realize that God is sovereign. And he's working in your kid's life in an even greater way than you can. I want to ask you, if you're here this morning, you're not a follower of Jesus. That's where it all begins. And I don't just mean being a parent, being a, a father or a mother. I mean it's where life begins. Jesus said he came to have life and that we would have it to the full, overflowing, in abundance. And it's in an intimate relationship with him that we can know that abundant life. So if you're here this morning, you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you. I'm going to come down to the front. You come down, give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart. And we will meet together this week and we'll talk about discipleship. What it means to grow in your relationship with Jesus.